um, without imposing the, any of the conservation laws. So we'll have that, that will have V3K divided by 2 pi cube. Uh, 1 over 2 e p 2 e I don't know. Okay. Um, uh, and then, uh, <coughs> let's see, 2 pi to the 4. And then the delta function that expresses the conservation law. So p plus k should be equal to the initial momentum, which is zero. So this is a three-dimensional delta function, and then there was one-dimensional delta function for the energy conservation. Yes? Why do you have an integral here? Very good. So let's uh, um, let's compute uh, the the full gamma. That's an integral. So the full gamma uh, is defined um, by an integral of uh, partial decay, of differential decay width uh, over, over, um, over the, the available phase space. So uh, let's integrate, um, let's take this formula. So there we have the integrals. Uh, but we should also multiply by the matrix element. Uh, and divide by 2n. So now, okay, so we, now we eliminate uh, the delta functions just one by one. So first we look at this delta function. So this delta function tells us that k is equal to minus p. And uh, so we should just substitute k in, in uh, for, we should substitute minus p for k wherever it appears. And where does it appear? Well, it totally appears here. So the matrix element itself, uh, Well, um, will only depend on, uh, or whatever, in whatever there is, we replace. So, in the calculation of the matrix element, the energy momentum conserv conservation laws are already included, right? So, this can only depend on on one of the particles, uh, and uh, energy and momentum. So anyway, we can uh, just write this as d3 p over 2 pi cubed. So here we substitute uh, uh, minus p for k. Yes? Them yeah, this is three momenta. So um, let's see. So out of this two pi to the four, uh, three two pi's canceled. This three two pi's. So we are left with two pi times delta m p squared plus m squared times two, and then minus m. 
And then we also have uh, the matrix element squared. So now I, I eliminate this delta function. So I can do another integration for free. Okay, so from these three integrations, one is fixed by the delta function. So I write my uh, uh, three-dimensional <coughs> volume element in, in momentum space as p squared dp uh, times the two-dimensional solid angle. As written in the picture above. So this will then be equal to integral over this solid angle uh, then uh, dp p squared divided by uh, 2 pi squared <coughs> so this um, 1 2 pi is cancelled so multiplied by 2 e e squared and then the delta function of 2 square root p squared plus m squared minus m and then whatever is uh, stands here And uh, now I use another delta function to integrate over the absolute value of momentum. So what's left is the angular integral. Uh, so there will be a factor of p squared divided by the energy squared. And then when I eliminate the delta function, I need to divide uh, by, um, I need to divide by the derivative uh, of the argument with respect to the integration variable. So this will be d square root of pi squared plus m squared differentiated with respect to p. So um, let me check the factors of ah. By the way, there is a factor of two missing in the formula. So. Um, you see this this two was missing there. So anyway, the final result will be d2 omega divided by 32 pi squared. Um, and then what's this integral? One can see that uh, d energy, the derivative of energy over momentum is velocity. This is a general relativistic, actually, um, that's not only general relativistic equation, it's very general definition of what is velocity. So the uh, group velocity is the derivative of energy with respect to momentum. So for a relativistic particle, velocity is momentum divided by energy, which you also obtain from here by their differentiation very easily. So this cancels uh, one power of P and one power of E. Uh, so we are left with this expression. <coughs> mm. 
Now, in this particular case, we can even integrate over the omega because certainly it doesn't depend on which direction the particles fly, right? So we just multiply the total result by 4, four pi, and that's it. Yes? Sorry, did you just say that you missed the factor to the previous phase differential? I think so. Yes, there is a... There is a factor of two missing, right? So this two should appear here. So the correct answer is one over 32 pi squared. Yes, P and E are related, of course, they are. Any more questions? Yes. Um, are we calculating D of gamma one to D gamma or just gamma? That's gamma. Right, so we are integrating for Because okay, I want to use this form over here that you boxed. If you say d gamma, you can d phi times your times yeah. your amplitude factor. Then that's the integrand here, okay? So this I would this I would call d gamma. And I need to integrate it over the remaining phase space. So the idea here that we use all the conservation laws which are trivially imposed. And so the, the remaining integral we call the phase space integral. Right, I'm just saying that if, if you look at that integral right underneath the momentum arrow things. Yes. Then, and I, and I compare it directly to the equation for d phi at the very top, then it looks like it should be d phi times your amplitude factor. And that would mean that what you calculated would be gamma. Uh, say again, please. Okay, sorry. Um, sorry, I think what he's trying to say is that there shouldn't be an integral sign at the, at, on the uh, right side of the d5 equation there. Yeah, yeah, should that be without an integral? No. Uh, because yes, no. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. So there's no integral at the top over there. <laughs> but then how, how does the... How does the three-dimensional integral become two-dimensional? Okay, my, my only risk base so, is just because of this formula yeah. over here. It's, it's just when you take the expression in at the top, and, and you just, just plug it into that formula over there, that's that's what, that's in the box. Uh, you, you will get that result, you, you just go just g, gamma, not the gamma. It's just formula when you take that formula on the top and plug it in. Just something. So... <coughs> Well, what should I say? So let us, so in this formula, let's uh, decide on convention. So in this formula, d phi means this. So then, um, um, right, so the formula for d gamma would then be uh, this thing. With the matrix element. So this would be d gamma. With only integral. The, yeah. So, so, so uh, on the very top, the, the, the formula on the very top shouldn't have an integral. On yeah. the very top, on the top board. Just, uh, hold on. So <laughs> then we want to, so the, the idea is then that, that we can always trivially remove four out of these six integrals by using delta functions. So we can just integrate uh, for free. <coughs> So that's what this integral there signifies. So in principle here we should write six, six integrals. And there we do four of them. 
So, and that is independent of this matrix element, of course. This is just uh, the use of the of the uh, uh, this is just the use of the conservation law. So, I guess in the literature, both this thing is called D gamma and this is called D gamma. But I mean, you can always reduce the that D gamma to this one by using conservation laws. Is it still confusing? Yes. So, to be clear, so either we don't integrate over phi until we have the full formula, or we integrate some the four integral beforehand, and just afterwards, when we look at gamma, just require momentum conservation in the formula for the m. Exactly, yes. So this is just a generic formula that's that's valid for the integral for for the decay to n particles and can be anything. Now this is a simplified formula that's valid for two particles where we can use momentum and energy conservation <coughs> to just eliminate the four integration variables. So then what what do we do next? Well, we can compute the total uh, width of decay in trend particles. So this is called partial decay width. The total decay width is equal to sum of uh, overall channels. So this typically a particle can decay into I mean, if you say, consider some unstable particle, it may have different decay channels. And so the probability of decaying into some particular final state will be given by the partial decay width. And the particle's lifetime is given by, so they are added in, like probabilities are added in quadratures, right? So the decay is with width are added uh, linearly. And so the total probability is char characterized by some <laughs> overall channels. So let's now consider <clears throat> the next case. Uh, namely, we consider the case where we have two particles in the initial state. Um, and uh, that corresponds to scattering. So scattering can be either elastic or inelastic. So when we have uh, the same particles in, fine, in initial and final states, that's called elastic scattering. So they just, uh, the particle, there is a target particle and there is a projectile and so projectile just is deflected by the target over some angle. So this would be an elastic uh, process. Uh, now, inelastic scattering corresponds to uh, some particle production take, taking place. So for instance, we collide, I don't know, two electrons, and out comes come two muons. So in the process, there is some change of internal structure of the particles. So this is then called uh, inelastic process. Um, we can consider them both on the same footing here. Uh, and uh, well, we need to understand how to characterize, um, how characterize the probability of, uh, of the scattering process. So let's first study the classical picture of uh, what we really want to compute. So, um, well, for that, let's uh, sort of uh, make a schematic simplified model of uh, scattering between particles. So let's assume that we have um, some target that consists of uh, particles uh, that we will model by rigid spheres, okay? So let's call this 
particles B, uh, we will assume that they are distributed with uh, density n b. So there is n, n, n b particles in unit volume. And uh, our hard spheres of radius uh, uh, that will denote by r b. And then there is some incident flux of A particles. So A particles we assume to be point-like. And they only interact with B particles when they collide the head-on. So they behave like uh, uh, air balls. So they only interact when... Uh, they really hit a B particle in the strict mechanical sense of this word. Uh, so the question is how many, so suppose that the particles A are sent uh, in by, uh, say, short pulses uh, of some duration T, and uh, then they move to some velocity V. So they have velocity VA. So this is completely non-relativistic now. Uh, the question is how many um, <coughs> how many collisions uh, will there be? Uh, which, of course, we can easily. Um, we can easily figure out how many collisions will happen. So suppose that the, the cross section of um, that the cross section of the uh, of the of this uh, bunch of particles is uh, oh let's say it's just around. Uh, Round pulse. Uh, it has a circular cross section, and so these particles are distributed with some uh, density, which we also know. Um, then what will happen? So there, we just um, well look how. So when we move this. Um, so when this pulse moves through the uh, target, um, in a sense, these particles will drill holes in this uh, in uh, well in this flux, and so uh, if you project them into the cross section. Uh, the fraction of the A particles uh, deflected. Uh, so the, the, the A particles that will undergo collision are those that are so, sort of lie in the shadow of the B particles, right? It's just, um, well, a geometric, uh, geometric uh, so way of um, <laughs> characterize what, what, what's going on. So um, the number of collisions uh, then will obviously be proportional to number of incident particles. And the fraction of incident particles that will experience collisions is equal to the <coughs> fraction of the shadowed area to the total area to the total cross-section of the bunch. Right? So this will be equal to, to what? To, to total number of B particles. And so each p particle occupies an area uh, equal to we'll call it sigma b, but sigma b is simply pi uh, r b squared. So this is the size of the b particle, uh, and then we should divide by the 
the total area of the bunch, the cross section of the of this in um, incoming part of of the of, of this flux of particles. So, um, but what we really want to, uh, I mean, it of course means that, so if you increase the, uh, the, the length of the pulse or the cross section, of course, the number of collisions will increase. So, uh, uh, correct uh, the f uh, intensive uh, measure of the number of collisions will be the number normalized to to the unit volume and to the un, to, to, to unit time. So um, So then we need to divide by uh, the volume and by time. And so this will be equal to NA times NB and sigma B divided by V times T times A. So this ratio is equal to just the density of B particles. Now T times A can also be expressed as a volume because we can write this as um, <coughs> so uh, we can express this as the length of the bunch uh, and measured in centimeters. Um, I guess divided by velocity, right? So the time length of the bunch will be equal to the spatial length divided by the velocity. And so finally, we obtain that the number of collisions per unit volume per unit time is equal to... Um, Proportional to the number densities of particles, velocity of uh, times velocity of the um, incident particles, and times the size of uh, the particles in, in the target. So, um, in a sense, this uh, this factor is just kinematics. Uh, boundary conditions, if you wish. So this is uh, given by particular setup that we are con considering. So what characterizes the collisions themselves is this quantity. So, um, in general, um, if uh, this, we consider a very simple model of interactions. So, this uh, particles B behave as black disks for particles A. Uh, if we consider the more general situation, the quantity that would characterize interactions between A and B will be uh, something of dimension of area. and this is called the effective cross section. So, in general, 
uh, two particle collisions are characterized by uh, by the cross section. So in a sense, this uh, the cross section defines uh, what so what transverse size. Uh, so if you have particles A, um, how big particles B? You will look for them. Um, So the way to calculate the scattering cross-section is through this formula. So we will, so this is the probabilistic measure of the number of collisions. It's a prob probability uh, of, um, right, so it will be equal to the number of events happening in unit volume per unit time. That's something that we can calculate using quantum mechanical uh, um, rules. Uh, so then after extracting this kinematical factor, what we'll get is an effective cross-section. So uh, to calculate the probability, we, uh, well, we have to multiply the phase space by, um, so this is, we are now considering a process in which two particles produce, collide and produce n particles. Mm -hmm. Uh, then we should integrate overall pos possible <coughs> moment of final particles with the measure dictated by the way we normalize the states. Um, then we should take a, the square of the matrix element. And so let the momenta of the incoming particles be Ka and Kb. So we have particles with momentum Ka and Kb um, colliding with each other. Uh, so that has to be normalized by the... Um, norms of their wave functions. And so this would define us the probability. So again, we substitute here the expression with the delta function. Uh, and yes, should be a square. That's right. So what do we get? Well, um, so we get the, this will combine with the delta function coming from the matrix element to the phase space times the reduced matrix element square.
And uh, then there will be a bunch of factors that come from, um, from normalization. So uh, each of these norms will give uh, uh, a factor of energy. Uh, and then we will have, uh, okay, so here, from here we'll get the volume of space time. And in the denominator, we will get a factor of volume square, right? Because each of this is volume normalized, each of the wave function. Now, if you compare this to uh, to the formula on the top of the blackboard, uh, then we will see that the number of collisions, so probability, what is probability? It is the number of collisions divided by number of A and B particles. So probability divided by <coughs> volume uh, divided by uh, volume and time will be equal to the number of collisions Um, so for, for the number of collisions divided by A and A and then and then B we, we get what? We get uh, the velocity uh, times the cross section and um, then divided by volume squared. Right, so here we use just, this is the kinematical relationship. This is, if you use this as a definition of what we call the, uh, the cross-section because it appears precisely in this way in the formula of, that we got over there. Right, so then probability we can calculate. So we should divide it by volume and by T. And what we should get is sigma times velocity divided <coughs> by volume squared. And this is precisely what we get here. So without these infinite factors, what stands here is the differential probability, but times the relative velocity of particles. So we thus find for the differential cross-section uh, the following formula. So it will be equal to the phase space times the matrix element squared and then divided by uh, what by four times the energy of the A particle times the energy of the B particle and divided by the relative velocity. Well, strictly speaking, um, strictly speaking, we, this formula is valid in the rest frame Um, of B, right? This is because all of our arguments were given in the rest frame where we considered, so in the frame where we considered some particles as a target and the other particles as projectile. And of course, 
physicist Lawrence Invariant, so we should be able to write this in general frame. So this, this formula should be Lawrence Invariant. So the claim is that uh, the in, <coughs> in any frame, um, what we should use for um, for the for this product is uh, a manifestly Lorentz invariant expression. So um, <coughs> I leave you as a home exercise uh, to prove that. Uh, that uh, this equality holds in uh, 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 in the rest frame of P. So if you set uh, the four the three momentum of B particles to zero, you should be able to see that the left-hand side is there will be the velocity of A particles times their energy times the mass of the B particles. Uh, and so um, it should be understood that uh, in the denominator in this formula, we have this square root. Then this formula will be valid in any reference frame. Yes? Sorry, is that, is that the dot product of the four momentum? So here, yes, this is a product of four momenta. So it's manifestly Lorentz invariant. So you can prove this. And the other statement that you can prove is that uh, if Ka is and K B are collinear. These are three momenta now, so the collision is head on. <coughs> then uh, the relative velocity, well, is the usual. Uh, I mean, And this is uh, the obvious. Uh, so we get the expected expression for relative velocity, just the difference between velocities of A and B uh, taken in absolute value. Uh, so all right, then we get uh, the formula for differential cross section. In any reference frame, it's written as uh, can be written through the Lorentz invariant uh, quantity. So the phase space is Lorentz invariant. This is also Lorentz invariant. So this cross section, in fact, is Lorentz invariant. Uh, now, if you want to compute the total cross-section, we just integrate over the phase space and sum over all possible uh, channels of the reaction. So on the next lecture, we will uh, actually apply this to, some, to the simplest process uh, in quantum electrodynamics, namely to production of uh, mu and pairs and E plus and minus collisions. Yes? Um, will, the, will the values of the of this sigma and the amplitude not depend on the frame? I mean, if you change the frame, you change no. the momentum, then you make No, M, M is calculated from Feynman diagrams. Feynman rules are Lorentz invariant. So the input is the momentum of the particles, right? This, which changes. So the, 
the Feynman rules are formulated in terms of four momenta. So whatever you get out from them will be Lorentz invariant. Can depend, depend on its momenta of external particles, but in such a way that it only products of four momenta appear. So each single, so then this is Lorentz invariant and this is Lorentz invariant. Therefore, the left-hand side must be Lorentz invariant. Yes? Um, I'm trying to see how you um, go from the um, first term of V to any term. So do you simply replace the uh, VA by V? Yes, absolutely. So, so this is the, the, the logic here is following. So we... Um, right, so what we get here uh, would be uh, would fit with our simplified picture in the frame where uh, B were at rest. Now, the crucial step here is to notice that <coughs> the expression, this square root expression, would reduce to um, V times C times E in that frame. And therefore, it's the correct definition of uh, the relative velocity in any frame. Uh, so in particular, in the frame where the four momenta are collinear, the relative velocity is literally the difference between velocities. But if you go in the frame where they are sort of collide at, at the angle, then uh, you have to use a more general relativistic expression. Okay, uh, I guess I'll stop here. Thank you, and then see you tomorrow.